Hey guys, Woodruff here. So let's talk about aplastic anemia now. Um, so we just left off talking about iron deficient anemia where we don't have enough iron and it leads to pretty much a straight up anemia, which is what we've um, talked about where you have like low hemoglobin, oxygenation issues, et cetera. But now we're gonna get into a different type um, of disorder where there's not just a low RBC or low hemoglobin, this uh, aplastic anemia is a disease process uh, where there is actually a low number of all your blood cells. So you have low white blood cells, low red blood cells, low platelets, um, which is what is referred to as pancytopenia. So um, penia, I think puny or small. Um, so pancytopenia is a low number of cells and pan means like across the entire pan. Um, like I think pan, think span, like over the entire lifespan, pan, it pans over all cells. Um, so usually this is caused by um, autoimmune uh, diseases, chemicals, um, and uh, different agents and toxins that can um, lead to this. There are certain drugs that can cause this, radiation, um, even viruses, bacteria can cause this. A lot of times there's also like it's idiopathic, we just don't know. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of, it can be closely related to autoimmune. Hey, let's try again. All right. Ooh. All right. So let's do a fill in the blank. So in order to understand this disease process, we want to kind of connect because there's really like with, um, iron deficient anemia, the main problem is there's low hemoglobin oxidation issues, but here we have three separate problems. So let's look at them. So first let's talk about your normals. So normal white blood cell range, um, we, uh, is it varies by book, but it's somewhere five to 10,000 is what I usually like to say. So, and that, and so you have to think about, okay, what would it be in a patient with aplastic anemia? Well, it's going to be lower. So it's going to be usually less than 5,000. Um, then the normal hemoglobin range is going to be, we talked about this in the first video about anemia, but I usually say the range is like somewhere 12 to 18. Um, so we're going to have a low hemoglobin. And then the normal platelet range is going to be, um, usually it's around 150 to 400,000. Um, so we're going to see less than 150,000. So now let's look at our three main problems this and do this fill in the blank together. So because their white blood cell count is low. Um, what are we worried about? So like, how does this translate? Cause I can all day long, like give questions about like, okay, um, this lab is going to be low, but what's the big, so what you always want to tie it back to you as the nurse, like, how are you going to, how is this going to affect your care? What are you going to need to do differently? What's the treatment going to be? So if I have a low white blood cell count, I'm worried that the client's going to be at risk for infection. Um, infection is the correct answer there because if their white blood cell count is low, their white blood cells, remember those are our fighters. They help to come in and fight infection and other problems. So if their white blood cell count is low, um, they're going to be at risk for um, having um, infection or being at higher risk for infection. All right, the next one, because their hemoglobin count is low, again, <laughs> hopefully we're getting the, the pattern here. Um, we're going to be concerned that the patient or client, whatever, is at risk for what? Um, well, anemia. But remember, what do we say is the big so what with anemia? Well, they can be at risk for oxygenation issues. So they could have oxygenation issues. Um, they could also go into shock, stuff like that. Last but not least, because their platelet count is... <gasps> No, I would be concerned about what? So what happens? So we've talked about their risk for infection, their risk for anemia or breathing issues, shock issues. What happens when our platelet count gets low? So platelets are responsible. They kind of add to the clotting process. So if I have a low number of something that adds to the clotting process, I'm not going to be clotting as much. If I'm not clotting as much, what am I doing? I am bleeding. So that risk for infection, bleeding, and like uh, breathing issues or oxygenation issues. So this just kind of displays all of those in here as I do my bad jokes. I'm running out of, I'm running into the itchy throat. So um, these are going to be low and then we're going to confirm a diagnosis, um, you know, sometimes through bone marrow testing and other things to see um, about, you know, maybe my production, if my bone marrow, like how much the cells are actually getting produced or if there's something going on in my bone marrow. Um, but these are all going to be low. So, um, like I said, this has to, um, we want to, we're going to, as if there's three different cells that have issues, there's also three different things I need to assess for at least. 
Um, and so I need to think about each thing. How am I going to assess for each problem? How am I going to assess for a low hemoglobin? How am I going to assess for a low white blood cell count? And how am I going to assess for low platelets? Um, so um, we're going to assess for, um, uh, you know, things like the general anemia symptoms. So the low hemoglobin might manifest like we talked about, pale, weak, tired. Um, we're going to ask them about their breathing, shortness of breath. And then we want to ask them about other problems they might have been having. Like, have they been sick more lately? Like thinking about that white blood cell count. How about for their low platelets? Have they been bleeding more easily? Um, for the low white blood cell count, have they had fevers lately? Like what's been going on with their infectious status? Um, then I need to assess and find all three problems. I'm going to assess their respiratory status to look for signs that they have um, are having anemia issues or low um, red blood cells, hemoglobin. Um, I'm going to assess for infection um, or any signs that they may be compromised in that area. And then also look for bleeding. And that's going to be associated with the low platelet. So they can have what's called petechiae, um, ecchymosis, or any sort of overt bleeding as well. And here's just some pictures that kind of demonstrate some of the ecchymosis um, here and the petechiae up here. So how do I know that they are getting better or worse? So a patient with aplastic anemia is going to be showing that they're getting better if they have decreased or no bleeding, because um, that's usually going to be a sign that their platelets are recovering or they're, they at least have enough to do basic functions. Um, we're also going to hope for no signs or symptoms of infection or improvement in their infection. Like maybe they finally have the defenses they need to fight the infection that's going on. Uh, we also uh, may see improved uh, oxygenation and breathing or uh, increased hemoglobin as a whole. Um, signs that they're getting worse. Um, so they could have bleeding problems. Um, so that could be overt bleeding. We could also find, I talked about that hidden blood or occult blood that can be found in their stool. Um, signs that their bleeding is getting really severe. If their blood pressure goes down, like they're going into shock. Um, we're looking all for signs that their platelets are getting super low. Um, infection problems, if they have a worse infection, if they have persistent or new fevers, so fevers that won't go away or fevers that are new or different or worse. Um, and then again, that decreased white blood cell count. And then anemia, we're looking for those same complications we've talked about for the other types of anemia where they're having worsening shortness of breath, um, problems with oxygenation, and their hemoglobin is decreasing as well. All right, so now we're going to break it down. I have each a slide for each of the three problems. So first, let's talk about for the problem of low white blood cells and infection risk, what are we going to do for this patient? Um, so we're going to, um, of course, if there's a known cause for the aplastic anemia, something that can be reversed, we're going to try to treat that because we can treat all of these problems. But again, if they still have a problem that's making it where they have low white blood cells, uh, we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, so we're also going to put them on what's called neutropenic precautions, and this is um, where we don't want anything that's going to really expose them to bacteria or put them at high risk. Um, so we don't do any fresh flower, flowers or fruit um, because both of these things um, can have bacteria on them. Um, and neutropenic precaution is what we also call reverse isolation, um, which is where we wear the mask um, to protect um, uh, protect us from uh, whatever we might have. Um, to help that patient. This is not, you know, necessarily done as often now because everyone's already in neutropenic precautions because we always wear masks in patients' room because of COVID-19. Uh, then there's also education that we want to give about when they're at home, like what are they going to do? So that's the general hygiene stuff, like wash your hands, don't get near sick people, don't go to crowds, um, that kind of stuff. Um, the, sometimes the only thing that's really going to fix um, a, what you call, and this is talking about aplastic anemia in general, like that if there's a known cause, treat it, bone marrow transplant. This is not just to fix the infection part of it, but just know like, again, this is some of the stuff that we, we might do. So we try to reverse the cause of the aplastic anemia if possible. Um, really the only thing that um, helps most of these people for re full recovery is going to be a bone marrow transplant, which is hard to come by, but it's possible. Um, and then if there's some sort of um, autoimmune cause, we might use immunosuppressants. All right, so now let's talk about bleeding. So for infection risk, we're decreasing the risk. We're um, putting them in reverse isolation to protect them um, and trying to do things to support their immune system. Um, and then, of course, get down to the bottom of the cause. So same for making bleeding better. I'm going to get to the bottom of the cause, reverse the cause if possible, bone marrow transplant, immunosuppressants if there's an autoimmune um, component. But what specific can I do if their platelets are low? 
Um, I want to do regular assessments for bleeding and then teach them bleeding precaution and educations. Apparently it's plural. Um, uh, so things that I teach with bleeding precautions are going to be things like using an electric razor only. They're going to be higher risk um, if they use a straight razor or um, other type of non-electric razor to cut themselves, which could lead to them bleeding and not being able to stop bleeding. I want to avoid needle sticks. I talked in my other um, beginning of the PowerPoint about how to avoid um, uh, more blood loss. So we want to do that. Anything that can cause um, blood loss, we want to like, you know, group all of their needle sticks together and limit the amount of blood that we're wasting um, from them. If we can't, well, that's more with anemia. So let me back that up. Let me say we want to avoid the amount of times we're poking them or any sort of trauma that has to happen to the patient. Cause um, there's just a patient, like when you have low platelets, you get cut, like you just keep bleeding and it's hard to stop to actually cl uh, clot off. Um, no contact sports and no trauma, but you know, you might be saying like, Psh, they're not doing that in the hospital, but, um, in the hospital, it translates to fall precautions, you know, low bed, bed alarm on safety socks, all that stuff. And then, um, people can bleed commonly from their gums. So like a soft bristle toothbrush. Last but not least, um, we are going to talk about anemia. So um, we manage the anemia the same way we managed all the other anemias that we've talked about so far um, when it comes to um, giving blood transfusion as needed. Remember with that hemoglobin less than seven, oxygen therapy to support, managing rest and activity, head of bed elevated, those really good neurological respiratory assessments and regular blood pressure checks, effectively just supporting the loss, preventing more loss and um, replacing as needed. All right, so now let's bring it together with an application check, because I just talked about how we're going to manage this patient from the three different um, aspects, three different problems they have. So the nurse is reviewing labs for a client with aplastic anemia, which action by the nurse is priority based on these results. So they have a white blood cell count of 5,000. Mm, it's on the low end of normal. They have a platelet count of 25,000. That's pretty low. Um, hemoglobin of 10.5. That's mildish anemia. You know, it's definitely anemia, but um, on the lower end of an, uh, on the higher end of anemia. So let's see, because um, it's asking for what's priority. So all these answers might be things that I do, but which one do I need to do first? Um, so apply nasal cannula to the client. So this would be something good for someone who's having oxygenation issues or has a really low hemoglobin red blood cell count. Um, looking at this patient, their um, hemoglobin, it's it's not that low. Um, you know, it might be somebody to do, and I know a lot of people think ABCs for this one, um, but we have to look at the data they gave us. You have to consider all data in the question. And right now looking at this, there's no data in the question that's making me think, oh my God, they're not oxygenating well. So let's go now to answer B. Prepare to administer a blood transfusion. Hmm. Um, so we usually don't transfuse unless they're less than seven and they're not showing any signs of acute blood loss, anything like that. So I don't really see where that is going to be a top priority either. Um, the next one's remove fresh, fresh flowers from the client's room. So you might automatically say, Ooh, aplastic anemia. We got to remove fresh flowers. Um, but we also have to look at their white blood cell count. So, um, generally not everyone with aplastic anemia is going to be on neutropenic precautions. Their white blood cell count actually has to get down to a pretty low level for them to be on neutropenic precautions. And their white blood cell count is actually still in normal range. Um, so there's nothing to warrant me to already move them into neutropenic precautions. So I don't think this is appropriate. Um, but let's keep going. Um, the last choice, have client ask for assistance when ambulating. So, you know, trying to piece this together here, like I have to look back at these labs. The one that's most concerned, the white blood cell count, pretty normal. The hemoglobin, it's on the high, uh, you know, high end of normal. Um, hmm, high end of normal, that sounds weird, but you know what I mean. So it's it's like, I mean, it's, it's not normal, but it's not that low. Um, the only thing that's super low here is the platelet. So then I want to be thinking in my brain, okay, what can I do? to um, help someone, you know, who has a really low platelet count. I really want to prevent them from falling or having injury. So would the client asking for assistance when they're ambulating help to prevent falls and therefore help to prevent a potential bleeding occurrence? Absolutely. Sure will. So D is the correct answer, but I know you're not going to like it. I know you're going to want something more like use a soft bristle toothbrush or something like exactly from the slide. But the point of giving you questions like this is really to think about holistically as a whole, how can you support your patients? And it might be something minor. You might say, well, psh, they're not going to fall. They're fine. Um, but you don't know. Um, we can't risk it. And so um, it, it's definitely one of those things that you need to think outside the box when you look at these questions. And sometimes it's not going to be the most common or most like 
um, easy thing to spot, but you have to think about how each of these actions will help with this patient. And then also what the data in the question is telling you is a problem. And the data in this question is telling me their platelets are super low, they cannot clot. So I need to see which one of these is going to help the pa a patient who cannot clot. The only one that applies to a patient that cannot clot is going to be D. Um, so yeah, hopefully that made sense. Only one more blood disorder to go and then blood transfusion. So we're getting there. See you for the next one in a second after I finally stop the recording.